Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event, which is co-hosted by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown University. Uh, in a moment, we'll be introducing our panelists and I'll be introducing the co-host, uh, Professor Patsy Lewis. But I just wanted to say a few words about um, the idea for today's event. Um, we are based in the US and clearly the issue of reproductive rights, more specifically abortion, has been on our minds uh, given the recent overturning of Roe versus Wade. And um, many of us um, you know, have been following the events closely and in, in many ways it confirms what we've been thinking for a while that the US cannot be equated um, with, simply be equated with women's rights and being the proponents of women's rights. Um, and um, those of us who have been working in other parts of the world, so myself in the Middle East, have known for a while that the issue of gender and sexuality, reproductive rights, the control of women's bodies is often at the heart of wider political struggles. We see this currently in Iran, where um, you know, after the um, killing of a Kurdish Iranian woman who was not wearing proper headscarf, we see now um, in many, many over 40 cities in Iran, people protesting and the issue of the control of women's bodies, women's rights is really at the heart of uh, contestation about the wider regime. So today we'd like to uh, explore issues of reproductive rights with reference to the Middle East and Latin America, but beyond a sheer di diagnostic, we also want to look at the kind of mobilization and strategies that women feminists in those regions are pursuing and maybe even providing some models and ideas for women in other parts of the world, including the US. Um, so let me introduce my co-host, um, Professor uh, Patsy Lewis. Patsy is the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and a visiting professor of international public affairs and faculty fellow at the Watson Institute. Patsy. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you today, especially our panelists. Um, I think you have a lot to teach us. Um, I am, I mean, Latin America in particular. I, I think when we look at what has happened in the US with the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the struggles in Latin America, one of the most, you know, it's some of the most restrictive regimes um, in respect of abortion, but seeing some positive developments. I think the lesson is that this is a constant struggle, it's ongoing and victories today can be overturned tomorrow. And um, so I think, you know, this is a very important discussion for us to have today. I, it is my pleasure to introduce um, two of our speakers. Professor Ali will introduce the other two. I will introduce, start with Tony Ann Broadbar, who will be joining us later. Tony Ann Broadbar is representative of the UN Women Caribbean Multicultural Office, Country Office. Before being appointed to this position in August 2020, she served as deputy representative from 2015 to 2020. Ms. Broadbar has earned as has served, sorry, as team leader for the Advancing Gender Justice in the Pacific Program with the UN Fiji Women, sorry, UN Women Fiji Multicountry Office and as gender specialist for the United Nations Development Program in South Africa. She has also worked with the UN Women South Africa Multicountry Office and has established what is now the UN Women Country Office in Haiti. Ms. Broadwell has also lectured in international relations and development studies at Yansan University in China and has directed and co-produced a film on Haiti. She received her first degree from the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, Jamaica, and postgraduate degrees in development studies and business administration from the London School of Economics 
and in Saudi Business School in Barcelona, respectively. Dr. Mabel Bianco is a specialist in epidemiology and medical statistics. She is a president and founder of Fondación para Estudio e Investigación de la Mujer, an NGO working to improve women's rights since 1989. Dr. Bianco is a researcher from the Center for Research, Physical Resources and Health at the School of Architecture, University of Buenos Aires. She is a coordinator for Women Won't Wait, a global campaign to eliminate violence against women, HIV, and a coordinator for the International Women's AIDS Caucus. From 1991 until 1999, she was the director of the Latin American and the Caribbean Women Health Network. And since 1996, she has been a member of the Buenos Aires Strategic Planning Council. She was awarded one of 150 women who moved the world in the news Women Deliver by the Argentinian Ministry of Health, was the NGO Committee on the Status of Women New York Distinguished Woman of the Year in 2017. BBC is one of 100 inspiring and influential women in 2019 and was designated one of Apolitical's 100 most influential people in gender policy in 21. Dr. Bianco is the author of 10 books and more than 150 articles. Well, um, thank you, Patsy, and welcome, Marvel and Tonian. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Selma Hadri, who is a medical doctor who specializes in reproductive endocrinology. She has more than 25 years of clinical and research experience in hormonal contraception and medical abortion, as well as training in sexual and reproductive health and rights in Tunisia and African countries. Dr. Hadri is Secretary General of the group Tahuida Ben Sheikh, a Tunisian NGO dedicated to sexual and reproductive health that she founded and led from 2012 to 2016, and Vice President of the Association of Women's Health in Africa, the Maghreb and the Middle East in France. She was the project leader of the Rausa Right and Access of Women to Safe Abortion Network in the MENA region for two years, which she created in 2019. She is also a member of the advisory committee of the International Campaign for Women's Rights to Safe Abortion and the organization Organisation pour le Dialogue pour l'Avortement Sécurisé, organization, the, the Organization for Safe Abortion Dialogue in Africa. Welcome, Sama. Uh, Leila Hesseini is a transnational feminist leader, advocate, and advisor with over 25 years of organizing and grant making experience, advancing human rights, gender equality, and sexual and reproductive health rights and justice in the US and globally. Leila was born in Algeria and educated in the US, France, and Morocco. She has held the position of vice president of programs at the Global Fund for Women for over five years, where she oversaw strategic grant making, movement strengthening, global advocacy, and philanthropic collaborations. From 2002 to 2016, she served on the senior leadership team of EPAS, where she published extensively on abortion rights and justice led global advocacy efforts and partnered with feminist groups working on self-management, community ownership and stigma reduction around bodily integrity and sexual and reproductive rights. She also co-founded an intersectional feminist consulting firm, Strategic Analysis for Gender Equality, while based in North Africa and led the Ford Foundation's Cairo Office's gender work. So um, I'm now going to ask, um, Patsy to ask the first question. The way we're going to structure the event today is that we'll be asking um, all panelists uh, a number of questions. And then later on, there's time for Q&A. So at any moment, if you have a question or a comment, please um, use the Q&A function um, down in, in Zoom. Okay, over to you, Patsy. Thank you, Nadia. We will start by asking all of you to speak about the situation in relation to reproductive rights with a focus of abortion in your um, specific context. 
It would be great if you could try to keep your answer to five minutes, please. We'll start with Layla. <clears throat> Oh, Layla. Thank you, Layla. Thank you. Layla. Thank you. No, that's fine. Thank you, Patsy. And thanks to the organizers for organizing this convening and bringing us together to discuss abortion access. And we're at a moment, as Nadia said, where we're observing increased surveillance, policing, and control of women in pregnant bodies with devastating consequences for health rights and justice. And so this conversation and thinking about the trends globally and how we learn from different regions is really, really essential for thank you all. In my presentation, I'll be referring to the Middle East and North Africa region as 21 countries that stretch from Mauritania to Iran that are majority Muslim. That's the research that I've done. This region is very diverse in terms of abortion laws, practices, individual religiosity, as well as the approach of religious scholars and medical providers to pregnancy termination. And so the laws exist across a big perspective, um, continuum um, from restricted to more permissive. So all the countries in the region allow abortion to save the pregnant women's lives. And this is grounded in Islamic jurisprudence that supports women's lives over that of the fetus until at least the latter achieves insolment or personhood that's defined at different stages according to the different schools of thought. Close to half of the countries permit abortion in cases of risk to women's health, and many also have included mental health in more recent years as a legal indication for abortion. Ten countries have modified their laws to include either rape or fetal impairment. Um, and it's interesting to note that both Tunisia and Turkey liberalized their laws, Tunisia in 1973, Turkey in 1983, to allow for first trimester abortions um, on request, basically, across a broad range of legal restrictions. Tunisia is unique in the region in that services are available for both married and unmarried women, and there's no spousal consent, as there is in some other countries. So as you'll know, in the US, 14 states totally ban abortion. In the MENA region, while services still are restricted, laws are actually more permissive. So while decriminalizing abortion is important, global studies have shown that abortion rates are actually similar in countries where they are legal and where they are not, because women have a lot of unintended pregnancies. Across MENA, um, there are about 2 million abortions every year with two thirds of those being considered unsafe or less safe by the World Health Organization. And we can talk about safety. Safety has really changed over the years given the prevalence of abortion with pills and trained providers. Women's formal and informal networks often provide information linked to drugs, uh, links to formal and informal providers, and also negotiate access to care and cost. So at the core of understanding, as has been said in the introduction, the issue of abortion, we have to look at where women's values come from in the MENA region, and a lot of it is through marriage and procreation. And so non-marital and non-reproductive sexuality, which are very, very common, are stigmatized and in some cases criminalized. So for example, in Sudan, research links the politicization of abortion with the politicization of quote, illegal sex or illegal pregnancies because fornification is illegal. So a woman seeking an abortion in Sudan risks being charged both for a medical procedure that is highly restricted as well as being charged with fornification. Uh, so those are things that are just interesting and important to acknowledge. Similarly in Morocco, there's a restricted law that's compounded by the moralizing discourse and stigma that women face who need services. We do know that Morocco is quite, their abortions are quite common. And if you've been following the news, a 14 year old girl just died two days ago as the result of an unwanted pregnancy and an unsafe abortion. And so feminists are in the street advocating for changes in that law. 
basically women can often get services, but they have to prove that they're vulnerable, that they're unmarried, that they're legitimate as vulnerable individuals to getting an abortion. So it's not a right to an abortion, but it is about if you're vulnerable, considered unmarried or having an unwanted pregnancy. In Turkey, Turkey has a liberal law, as I mentioned earlier, since 1983, but what's interesting to note that in recent years, research has shown that the combination of neoliberal approaches to privatizing healthcare and neoconservative approaches led by the Islamist regime has resulted in decreased access to abortion, increased at cost to abortion held by women, so out-of-pocket costs, as well as decreased costs in terms of reimbursement that providers can get from the public health system. So really interesting to note how the links between privatization and neoconservatism come together in Turkey. The situation is even more complicated in the occupied Palestinian territories. So West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, as you all know, abortion access is restricted because there are legal restrictions. It's under Jordanian law in the West Bank and East Jerusalem and a combination of Jordan, Jordanian law and Egyptian law in Gaza. Um, so there are legal restrictions, hospital uh, restrictions, also restrictions on ability to travel to safe sites, which mean that it's highly restricted in Palestine. So women often have to go to very expensive privatized providers, either self-induced with medical abortion or sometimes go to Israeli hospitals and clinics in, for example, East Jerusalem to get care, which brings with it all kinds of political issues around going to the occupying force to get the abortion services. So there's a lot of politics around that, of course. Women across the region also terminate pregnancies by accessing medications and guidance through hotlines. So there are global hotlines and there's regional hotlines that either just provide guidance because misoprostol um, is available in some countries over the counter or they also will send drugs to women. Um, and as you know, in the US as well, over 50% of abortions are completed by abortion pills. That's increasingly the method that women use. And so we're seeing that in the region as well, even though there's not a great deal of research on that. So I think I'm at my five minutes. Um, very quick kind of overview and look forward to engaging more around mobilization and organizing strategies in the region. And I'll pass it to my friend and colleague, oh, well, Patsy and then Selma, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Leila. Um, Selma? I think your sound is off. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really very happy to be here and to have this opportunity to talk about the experience in safe abortion and uh, in reproductive rights in Tunisia. Uh, Leila has already given a, a very nice and very um, global overview of the situation in the Middle East and in North Africa. In Tunisia, as she already said, it's quite uh, different. The law exists since the beginning of the 70s, and it has been applied in a very, very um, strong way, as there were a very strong political will to make it available for all women, especially for poor, the poorest women and the women in the vulnerable situation and far from the, uh, the cities. So the law for abortion is very clear. It's legal and upon a request for all women, even for young women and married women until 12 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, this uh, medical abortion have been, in this context, have been introduced quite um, recent, not so recently, because it's the first country in the region, even uh, before um, Latin America, I think in some extenses for Mifi Priston, um, have been introduced in Tunisia in the, uh, at the end of the 90s. And it is now the most used method for abortion in Tunisia. Uh, so as I told you, it's allowed for unmarried women, at least uh, for all women that are major, more than 18 years, they need the, the, the 
parents' authorization when they are young, younger, but still it's always available in all the public services um, upon request and it's free of charge. Uh, as you can, uh, what can I say other than that uh, almost 40% of the, uh, of the um, abortion are performed for young women and 23% of the women are not unmarried women, even if they are older. So it's really some uh, a service that is available for all, all women, all kinds of situation uh, for women. And this has been from the beginning of the 73 till 2011 or around 2011. As you know, uh, 2011 was a, period, uh, was a year, very um, special year in the region. And Tunisia started with this uh, spring for uh, the Islamic region, which is not really Islamic, but uh, in Tunisia, it was the first country where there was the, this revolution. And the revolution started also with the rise of the Islamist power. So um, Islamists were uh, politically very strong and very influenced, influencing the opinion during as after 2011. Even if there was no changes in the law, they ch there were changes in the attitudes and changing in the social cultural context with um, a big um, influence of the leader, the re religious leader coming from the Middle East region to change um, several, um, habits and uh, common uh, attitudes in Tunisia. Uh, one of the example is they, they tended to introduce the, um, how do you call it, um, the uh, la fibulation, the, the excision for women, which is not practiced at all in this region, in the, Mag in the North African region. Although this abortion is still legal, but sometimes it started to be inaccessible and taboo essentially for the young woman and unmarried woman. There are, uh, we have seen increased stigmatization and more and more refusal of providers to provide abortion services. There is a lot of fear from, from all sides. Doctor started to be very reluctant to provide abortion. Midwives and other providers are increasingly, uh, increasingly conservative in this environment and started to refuse to, have, to give services and we have to say that also the political will quite disappear from the country. So this, um, this led us to um, not reducing the, uh, the abortion rate, but reducing the access to abortion, making it more, uh, more difficult and make it, it difficult for the poorest woman because they had to go to the private service to have abortion. So they have to pay, which was not at all the situation in the Tunis in Tunisian country. Um, so Tunisia was still uh, as the rest now of the Arab world with providers that became sensitive to the religious arguments and began to voice objection to uh, erect barriers to access to abortion and even for contraception to young people. This is the situation in Tunisia, but uh, this is one of the side. The other side that's, and, and we talk probably later about this, that we have seen also a, a big influence of the civil society and the resistance to this barrier and trying to avoid this barrier to make it available, all services available for the young woman and the population in Tunisia. Thank you. I think I have not. Okay. Take yeah, too much did. time, I hope. Yeah, you did very well. <laughs> Thank you, Selma. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to um, welcome Ms. Tony Ann um, Broadbaugh. And um, we will move on to looking at Latin America, starting with Mabel, Mabel and following with Tony Ann. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share with you our experience in Latin America specifically. Meanwhile, we work together with the, our colleagues and friends and, and militants from the Caribbean, where we have strong relations. Uh, as you know, our countries are general 
uh, uh, agree with the Catholic Church. We must all have the Catholic Church as our religious. And meanwhile, it's not true how much we are following it. Is it true for the governments? So most of our countries didn't have uh, open access to safe abortion due to this relation or dependence for the Catholic Church. So our laws were very restrictive. In, and one of the problems is are the high level of the maternal mortality that we were suffering due to unsafe abortion. And this is something that it is so important that the many NGOs and feminist groups in 1986, we created in Colombia, the Latin American, the Caribbean Women's Health Network. And the main point was to fight against the maternal mortality. This was really very impressive. And we were uh, uh, all together, this group grows a lot, but the problem was not solved due to the countries didn't change the laws, the restrictive laws. But in general, they recognize the right to have an abortion if it's a risk of life, and sometimes if it was a rape, but sometimes, but it's more for the risk of life. But uh, during the time, the things were not uh, improving. They were making bad and bad. And for example, during the dictatorship of Pinochet in Chile, we have a comeback and they denied all forms of abortion, all forms. They were not recognized and they were forbidden. And they were also in some of Central America as Nicaragua and some others. So this was something that make us uh, more preoccupied. And we were in the network, the Latin America and the Caribbean Women's Health Network, we were pushing to be strong for the international conference on the ICPD we call in Cairo, because we suppose we need to make them to have a change. And so, as you know, in Latin America, the feminists, we are very militant and we are very aggressive and we are very hard workers. <laughs> and we were there in, in Cairo, but uh, we were very happy that the reproductive rights were recognized, not the sexual rights, but at least the next year in, in, in uh, Beijing, we reached that, but in abortion, we couldn't mobilize so much because it says that agreement that it needs to be according to the laws. And in our countries, the laws were not changed for better, they were changed for worse, and that's the problem. So we continue fighting and we have some succeed in some counties, but one of the important points was in Uruguay. In Uruguay, we obtained five years ago, the first law in which the safe abortion was accepted and recognized as a right of the women and they adopted a way in which all pregnant women attending a health service needs to be informed that the right they have to interrupt the pregnancy if they want. And this was a great succeed because it's the first time that happened in our region. With this in Argentina, my country, we were fighting for the last 20 years to change the law. But in, with this in 2019 or 2020, yes, 2019, we were hard working and we associate this 
uh, fight we have with the uh, green scarf with the uh, fight to eliminate violence against, against women because to oblige to continue a pregnancy and oblige the women to have an unsafe abortion, this is a violence. And we denounce this and the, the movement increased. So the 8th March, we have a big mobilization and we continue in June, 2015, it was the most great uh, mobilization, but along the years, we include the young people and the adolescents. It was incredible how they put together this. They recognized how this is unfair because the women who die for unsafe abortion were those poor women, those that have money, could pay an abortion and they have a safe abortion. They denounce as hypocrisy and they mobilize with us. So we pass a first law in the uh, uh, representative chamber, but not in the Senate. Two years later, we obtained the law in 2020, December, at the end, it was the, the the end of the year, and we were there pushing for the for the green with the green scarf, and we, we were there. But now with the law, we are fighting for to have it access for all women. And to finalize, one of the problems we are having that we are having now in Central America, in some of those countries, forbidden for all sakes. And the words case is the case of El Salvador, in which we have the 17 women that they are in prison for many years because they were supposed they have an abortion. And many of them, they have an abortion. They have an early pregnant uh, delivery and they were put in jail and they don't want to take them off. Meanwhile, we are fighting. Now we have two or three of those women liberated, but they are still there and they didn't change. And one of the problems is the more progressive governments are not with us. And this is a pity. So we need the countries that understand the life of women are respect if they recognize their rights because forbidden abortion only increase the risk for women to die for unsafe abortion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mabel. Um, and we now move on to Tony Ann to give us a Caribbean perspective, our perspective on the Caribbean. Um, I guess it's we're, we're asking everybody to keep their comments, the initial comments to around five minutes. Hi. Absolutely. Tony. Hi, it's lovely to see you again. I also saw my aunt online, so I have to do a bit of a big up because I've never had a session in which my aunt is there. Hi, Velma Pollard. Um, <laughs> we all rest on the shoulders of giants, and she is one that I rest on. I'm in Trinidad and Tobago right now. And we were talking about Hazel Brown, who recently passed in the work that she has done. And I think generally, the work that she has done and the work that many have done in our region has been beneficial in terms of sexual reproductive rights. And if we're talking specifically about abortion in the Caribbean, we are in, in many ways in a good position. We look at abortion as either whether you can get it on demand. There's only really one country in the Caribbean where that is possible and the gestational limits still vary and that is Guyana. But the first country in our region to have abortion rights was Barbados. And this was in 1983, pushed by Dame Billy Miller. And Barbados is still one of the very few countries in our region. There are now only two or three countries where you have abortion based on a broad social economic ground. It's not only within the life of the mother to preserve the health of the mother. And that is Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Belize. Then you have those countries that do allow abortion in terms of protection of the mother's health. 
And that includes some of the saints. We have St. Vincent and the Grenadine, sorry, St. Kitts and Nevis, Grenada, St. Lucia, and where I am today, Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the Bahamas. Then we have the countries that do not allow abortion at all. And, and that unfortunately includes many of the Dutch speaking countries. We have Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and Antigua and Barbuda will allow it only to save the woman's life. But I forgot that both Cuba and Puerto Rico also allow it on request. And what the conversation has been in the Caribbean of late is an understanding of where does life begin and where do we value life? And of course, I don't think it's only in the Caribbean, but this notion of when does life begin and whose life do we value most is one that continues to be a barrier towards moving forward with regards to legal abortion and an understanding of the integral nature of this accessibility to this right for women's socioeconomic viability, empowerment, and that of children and men as well. The other issue in the Caribbean that we are seeing as a real challenge, and it comes up at every commission on the status of women, is that of comprehensive sexuality education. Because this is the prevention that we're talking about. It is either manifested through the HFLE program, which is the Human Life um, and Education Program. And that is something that we are seeing goes hand in hand with those countries that are most reluctant to legalize safe abortions are those that are also reluctant to provide comprehensive sexuality education. Now, every single Caribbean country in terms of CARICOM member state has ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And so there is a state obligation to deliver on both of these things. So I'll stop there for now. It's a very general overview, but it gives you a bit of a lay of the land of what the reality is right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Ann and uh, all of you. I'm now going to switch the discussion to focus on the kinds of strategies for mobilization that um, has taken place both locally and transnationally. So uh, I'm going to start uh, and turn to Leila and ask her if she could uh, speak about it. I We already have one question. So again, you know, if you could keep your comments um, as briefly as possible so that we can yeah. also get to the questions. Leila, over to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, so in terms of mobilization strategies, I'm just going to highlight six. To begin with, because, because there's a lot of movement, right? Abortions have existed since time immemorial. Laws are constantly changing. Services are changing. Feminists have always organized around this and will continue to do that. So one is around just the stigma work and destigmatizing abortion and pregnancy termination. Unintended pregnancies, the latest UNFPA report shows how common they are. 121 million unintended pregnancies every year. That's 200 every minute. So they're just common. Whether we have comprehensive sexuality education or not, we certainly need it. And contraceptives fail. They're not accessible. They're costly. Men don't want women to use them. There's all kinds of reasons why we have unintended pregnancies. And forcing somebody to continue an unwanted pregnancy is a crime against humanity and a human rights violation. So really changing the narrative around abortion as something to move to something that is just a normal part of women's lives is one strategy. Uh, so the destigmatization work that accompanies the decriminalization and demedicalization work is key. I think also getting to the core of what is happening and having more anthropological studies on women's experiences with abortion. A lot of the work is a very medicalized approach to abortion. There's magazines that you're on the board of, Nadia, like Kohol, a journal for body and gender research in Lebanon, that's doing fascinating research and work in Arabic on women's experiences with sexuality and reproduction. And I think more, the more information and knowledge we have from women's experiences, 
is really, really important. I think the third strategy is really to connecting abortion with a range of other issues. So Mabel spoke about how critical it is to gender-based violence work. Tony Ann about how critical it is to comprehensive sexuality work. Selma spoke about the Tunisian law it was reformed at the same time that the family codes were reformed. So we can't think about abortion access and rights as separate from bigger human rights that women have to leave lives of opportunities of rights and justice and um, free of human rights violations. Uh, the fourth opportunity I see is that while addressing legal barriers is essential, as we've heard from everyone, it's just usually incremental change. It's really rare that a country will highlight abortion as a human right, or in the case like Canada, not have an abortion law at all, which is another strategy that we could use. But really thinking about access issues um, in addition to the legal issues. And so we do have access in many places now to misoprostol and mipipristone, to abortion with pills, how we think about making those pills more accessible through telemedicine, through hotlines, through mail programs, through having medications in our pharmacies because we may need them one day is also a way of thinking about access issues and ensuring that abortions are provided at all levels of the healthcare systems, nurses, midwives, middle mid-level providers can provide pills. So really thinking about those access issues. Um, many panelists, um, also spoke about global solidarity in action. So we are fortunate to have global agreements like the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women as the International Conference on Population and Development Plan of Action. The African Union Maputo Protocol is the first regional protocol to recognize medical abortion as a right. And these are all tools and instruments that have moved us away for more of a population control approach to women's health and rights to one that's more grounded in women's health and rights. And we can use those to advocate more with multilateral institutions as well as our own governments. And then finally, I would say that funding really matters. One of the big challenges is that there's a lot of money that goes into maternal health and quote family planning and contraceptive access and little money that goes into abortion. And so we need to advocate for more commitments from governments and multilateral institutions to the issue of abortion. In the MENA region, there are feminist funds like the Doria Shafiq Fund, the Mediterranean Women's Fund, Urgent Action Fund Africa, that all provide funds for women who may need abortion, also for legal protection and legal um, support for women who may be criminalized because they access services in a way that may not be considered um, legal. And so the funding of services really matters. In the US, we have the National Network of Abortion Funds. Abortion rates and costs, sorry, abortion costs go up considerably when abortion is restricted. Yeah. And those costs are coming out of the pockets of women. So funding this work really matters and that's a key strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, for um, this very useful overview of the strategies and also making some of the connections. Uh, Selma, would you uh, be able to share some of your reflections and experiences in terms of strategies for mobilization? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Leila, because you have already exposed everything about the uh, all the possibilities and all the uh, strategy that we can develop. So I will just focus on what we have done in Tunisia and what are the lessons learned and what we have tried to do with this network for Middle East and uh, MENA and, MENA and uh, North Africa. So we thought that the most important thing after 211 was to raise awareness and advocacy and to target populations, first the providers, but also the civil society. Uh, Tunisia particularly, the civil society and the feminists were not very um, concerned by the problem of access to abortion because there was no problem. But um, now we, uh, we um, I'm, I think we reached this uh, population of feminists by um, creating more networking, more contacts, and trying to develop their awareness on the risk of 
put separating all the uh, different aspects of feminism and putting ad, uh, abortion and uh, reproductive rights outside the other feminist uh, fights and especially violence against women where abortion access to abortion is one of the most important so we worked on that we developed value clarification trainings for providers and we tried to make it as large and as important as possible training um, training of trainer have been also developed for the providers we also tried to develop um, education sexual education and to make it available for young people, not only for school, but also through the website, through uh, documentation, through videos, making them available for all the uh, Facebook and Instagram sites and young uh, population to uh, disseminate uh, this kind of documentation to the young people. We also developed um, information about abortion and uh, reproductive right, rights uh, simplified for the uh, organization of the civil society who care of women, of women working in the rural area in communities and in this uh, um, industry where women are most involved. And finally, uh, we found that trying to make a network uh, for this region where nobody had uh, the opportunity to talk about abortion or to talk about sex. As you said, Leila, it's something, I think the key problem of the region is talking about sex and considering that sex is the right of the woman and that the, the, the body of the woman is her body and nobody have to, to uh, take uh, any power on her body. So we developed a network two years ago, three years ago now, and we try to have this um, networking through all the countries uh, of the region, mainly in Palestine, in Egypt, in Iraq and, and um, Syria. Uh, also, we try to uh, use the, uh, the um, experience and the, uh, the capacities of Tunisian and Turkish uh, feminists to try to um, make available all the documents in Arabic and in other language, trying to help to translate the, all the documents in uh, all the local language. Um, that's it for the moment. And I think it's quite, quite a lot of work to do now. We have a lot of work to do. And uh, the, biggest, um, the biggest challenge is to talk with the politics mm. in this region. And uh, probably we have to develop a real strong advocacy uh, for uh, reaching the politics. Thank you. Yes, I think that is something that probably cuts across um, depending on the specific forms of regimes. I'm now going to turn to Mabel and ask her to share um, her experiences of um, strategies for mobilization. Mabel? Uh, thank you so much. And as I said before, uh, we started um, in the 80s regionally fighting for this. And one of the strategies was to inform about the numbers and the rates and how unsafe abortion is moving and provoking the uh, died of so many women in the region. The other strategy was to create an special day for mobilization. As we have the 8th March in 92, I think, in, in Buenos Aires, in, the, in Argentina, not in Buenos Aires, in the um, uh, meeting, a feminist regional meeting, we, as the network, we create the 28th September as the day to mobilize uh, for abortion. And this was something that grows and we uh, developed many, many actions in all the country those days or around those days, mobilizing and making the people to know and to have some ideas. And the, the other was, of course, to mobilize uh, around the issue of how many women were in prisons 
due to abortion or supposed to have an abortion as really to demonstrate how this is a consequence affecting, if not the life, the future and the future of the family. Uh, supporting this in Argentina, specifically, I'm going to speak now from my country, uh, we created a network that we call the Campaign for Legal Abortion um, in a, a sure and free. Uh, and we developed this as our logo, this green scarf with this logo of the women. And we started to mobilize. And this was associated, as I said before, with the movement to fight against violence considering that to force women to have an unsafe abortion is an a violence, violate their rights. So with this Greek word, and we make um, a movement that was expand to all our region. And you are going to see many of these scarves with different logos inside that from the different counties. It doesn't matter. This is how we mobilize. And for this, the other strategy in Argentina was to open debates in the media and to have the possibility to oppose and discuss, discuss openly with those against. And this was very successful because of course, what we demonstrate is that this was a problem for poor women that are dying because they have no money to pay an abortion, and a, a safe abortion. And this is happening, and this was something that makes a lot of, of sense. And finally, we decided to go to the parliament and start mobilizing our representatives there. And after 10 years discussing with them, finally, we could obtain that a group of them propose a law following our criteria, because we have a law, we develop a law, and it, this was presented and for the first time discussed in the chamber and was accepted. But when it was went to, to the Senate, it couldn't pass. So we continue way working with representatives and with the senators. And two years later, we win. What this means, that this is something that we need to do for a long time, and we need to perseverate and increase. So now we have the, doc, the medical doctors, the lawyers, the um, obstetricians, uh, the young people, different groups that they are associated with us defending this green uh, policy. And as we have the law now, we are moving and mobilizing to everybody knows and have access. This is nothing easy. And finally, we are now working with the National Ministry of Health to support to have this access, but we need also money to do our advocacy. And this is some of the problems in our region because our government couldn't help us and we are not elected in most of the donors. So this is something that we are doing, but with very few resources. But we hope this is going to be a succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mabel. Well, I think what comes through in uh, all of your respective uh, presentations and sharing of experiences, both in terms of the situation, but also the mobilization around it, is that was the, the very the importance of class and you know who has access and to the, who doesn't have access, and that those um, those women who, by virtue of having access to resources um 
will have access to safe abortions in many contexts, you know, whether they, uh, you know, even when they have to travel, uh, but it is really uh, affecting the most vulnerable and poor women, um, mostly in, in many countries. I'm now going to turn to Tony Ann and uh, ask uh, you, uh, Tony Ann, to reflect on your um, experiences and um, teach us about the kinds of strategies for mobilization you have come across in the Caribbean, which of course, there are lots of different uh, places, but um, I'm looking forward to, to hear from you. Thanks so much. And, and I think what I can share is that a lot of the tactics that have worked and the strategies have, that have worked have been the strategies that the colleagues have already outlined. One of the first is engaging effectively with government and parliament. When there is an ally in the legislature, then you start to really have someone pushing. And this is from 1983 with Dame Billy Miller um, to now. In, in other jurisdictions, if there's someone in parliament who really has taken this on board, then you at least know that the support and advocacy of civil society is going to be translated into a bill and hopefully into an act and definitely tabled at the parliamentary level. One of the things that we have been trying to do is we've been collaborating with colleagues at Pal Americas and the Equality Fund to engage civil society so they are better equipped to effectively advocate on issues such as this with parliament. They better understand the parliamentary processes so that they can better engage effectively. The other thing that works, and this is really led by our colleagues at UNFPA, is to do that work on comprehensive sexuality education. Ensure that that is provided to young women and young men and not only provide the comprehensive sexuality education, but also support governments to provide contraception. Yes, contraception may not work, but at least if it is provided and it's accessible and it is cheap or free, then people have access to it as well. The other issue that we have been working on that, that we see really starting to bear fruit is taking a multi-sectoral approach. This, if you only boil the conversation down to one of where does life begin, then you're not addressing some of the broader issues of, again, where do the lives of the lives that have been actualized, where are rights realized? And you're looking at it from a socioeconomic rights perspective, and you're also looking at it as a, an issue that is linked to what happens in the long term when women are able to control what happens to their bodies and what happens in the long term to those women who are unable to do so. When we change a conversation to one of this is going to happen anyway, especially for those, as you were saying, in lower socioeconomic classes, the decision is going to be made. The issue is whether it is going to be safe and legal or unsafe and criminalized. And then the last thing that is critical is working with faith-based organizations, working in civil society with the faith-based organizations to understand that last point, that this is not just an issue, a one-dimensional issue. This is a multi-dimensional issue that involves many lives, realized lives, as well as the unborn. So having the conversation, bringing them on board so that we understand its nuance but we do need to deal with the reality of the consequences of when abortion is criminalized and when it is unsafe. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much. I mean, I actually, one of the questions that sort of started to, um, I started to think about listening to, to you all is the question of faith and, um, you know, having sort of a comparative lens, I was wondering, you know, in terms of how the Catholic church on the one hand and Islam on the other hand, how that plays out in the respective context. But um, I'm, maybe uh, Patsy has also a question, but I suggest that we uh, move first to the Q&A because I see there's a question by Bruce Stanley, which is specifically focused on the MENA region. Although I think we can also extend it to both Latin America and the Caribbean. The question being, what cities might be considered safer cities for getting access to abortions 
such that women cross state boundaries to access abortions in those cities? What factors have led them developing such a regional uh, reputation? So I suggest that we will open this up to um, across uh, the different regions. And uh, maybe we are asking, um, well, let's ask Marvel first, uh, and then we, everyone, if you have an answer or an idea about this question of, you know, which cities might be considered safer cities where abortion is considered uh, concerned. Marvel, do you want to have a first? Call? Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, well. Uh, for us, the issue of uh, safe cities are those in which the opposition is less active. And what we need to say is that uh, in the region, in Latin America specifically, the growing of the neo uh, Pentecostal or neo evangelic uh, movements and religious groups are making more trouble than the Catholic now because they are mobilizing the people very actively, reaching the poor people, mm -hmm. and uh, also having a, a great contact with the politicians. They are paying some campaigns for politicians. And for example, in Brazil, they have in the parliament, the, um, the group of uh, neo-Pentecostals neo that are from different countries, but they are specifically mobilizing against comprehensive sexuality education, against sexual and reproductive health and rights, and against abortion, mm -hmm. these three. So this is something that we are very, very preoccupied mm -hmm. because this is a, a way in which we need to strengthen our efforts. And of course, they have much more money because they have all the support from the US and the groups there, and they are strong. Meanwhile, still now, we are winning, but we need to take care because in some regions, I must say, and with this I finish, in Argentina, we are doing a research in some uh, areas, rural, very uh, away from cities, uh, big cities, and they are uh, going and not allowing the families to send the children to the school when they are going to have comprehensive sexuality education this day. They are obliging the young women that have put, are using contraceptives, including the implant, to take it off and to stop mm -hmm. that. And they oblige them to marry if yeah. they are having sexual relations. Right. So right. this is a very, still is not in the big cities but is moving and maybe, maybe it's going to be a problem. It's yeah. different from some other countries, but for example, in Mexico, each uh, province or state have the law. In that case, we are mobilizing in order all they are going to have the same law and in the uh, Mexico city or federal district or how they call now, I don't know. If not, yeah. they need to go to Mexico City. Thank you. Thank you, Marvel. Uh, Leila, I was wondering if you could also uh, reflect on this question. And I'll yeah. ask Salma yeah. and then Tonian. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's interesting. Tunisia, as the first Arab and African country to reform its law, used to be for a long time like this center for training for providers around abortion. And there always has been movement across borders for people who can travel. And I think that that's a critical question because for a lot of people, they can't travel. And in Texas, when abortion was restricted, women and certainly undocumented women couldn't travel because the risks were too great. So I think we have to 
it's a complicated question, like who can travel, where they can travel. There are countries in the region where people go more for abortions. Syrians go to Lebanon. People did used to go to Tunisia. I don't know if that's still the case. Selma, you can say more about that. Um, Palestinians may go to Israel. I mean, there is some travel across borders. Um, so I think that that's one question, but then it's the question also of, of who can travel. We see also just in the US, a lot of travel from Texas now to Mexico, where you can get an abortion easier than you can in the US. And so that is a reality of our worlds that our borders don't make sense for pregnant people. If you do need to terminate a pregnancy, you will cross a lot of state lines and people are doing that all over the world in order to, you know, accomplish what your needs are and your need to terminate a pregnancy that is unwanted or um, unintended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Salma? Uh, you're muted. These have always been from the beginning, the place where uh, Algerian and Liban, uh, live and from Libya, uh, people come for uh, abortions, they also come for other health uh, issues also because uh, mm -hmm. the quality of uh, health uh, doctors and uh, health uh, uh, hospitals and clean, private clinics now are quite good for the region. We have also now uh, travel traveling for, not really for abortion, but abortion also from African countries, from the Francophone region, because we have flights that goes direct flights from uh, Senegal, from um, Burkina, and from uh, Ivory Coast. And sometimes we have uh, we we have tra people who travel to have an abortion in in the context of other uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, they can have it in all the cities. I mean, uh, people from Libya come um, frequently by car and travel to the cl closest city uh, of Tunisia in Jaba or in other small cities because they have uh, the possibility to have abortion. The other point is that they, in uh, for North African countries, there are, um, how do you call this, legal, um, legal agreements between the countries and health uh, or family planning services are free even for Algerian and uh, Libyan people. Right. So it's quite um, positive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Tony Ann, would you like to comment as well? Sure, I mean, I think of course, crossing borders in our region is much more difficult. You have to get on a boat yeah. or a plane, but consistently there, there has always been for those who can, uh, medical services are provided in a few countries, you know, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados have always been hubs for any kind of service that you need. Now, wealthy people in these countries know how to access doctors in any case who will provide the service for you so that you would not have to move to a safe city, uh, travel to a safe city, as, as it's been called, to, to access an abortion. Thank you. I see there are a couple more questions. I don't know, Patsy, if you want to read them out. Yeah, sure. Um, Philip Weinstein is asking, to what extent is the abortion issue a male-dominated control issue as contrasted to a religious-based belief that controls both males and females? So to what extent is this really gender or religion? Anybody wants to start? It I kind of brings me to a question I had when you are talking about mobilization. To what extent do you need to bring men on board? What are the different kinds of political constituencies, both nationally, regionally, internationally, that need to come together to really move the needle globally? as opposed to specific conditions in one country. May I? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I consider it's important to mobilize men, but how in our experience, the way was uh, using and associating abortion to uh, violence 
uh, against women. This was the way to obtain them to understand and to be ready, first of all. Um, and this was helpful. And of course, in the young people and adolescents was more helpful because they were reaching their parents at home asking why you are not supporting these ideas. This is, and they give the arguments and this is very, very helpful. And the other point is in the parliaments. Most of the politicians are men. Now we have the quota laws or the parity. With them, we improve the possibility to pass some laws better. But as you know, to be a woman is not sufficient to have a feminist perspective. That's another problem. And so we need to work also with both gender as politicians to let them know the issues and the discrimination and the problems that those are inside these issues. So I don't know if I answer, but this is our experience. <laughs> You answered me, but I think it would be great if, you know, the other uh, responses also reflect on this tension between male control as opposed to religion and how the two um, work together may I, on that. May I just make sure. a comment? I think that uh, we have to, to remind and don't forget that uh, abortion issues come from first from religion. Um, affirmation. I mean, religious uh, religions or Catholics or uh, Islamists, and perhaps Islamists that less than the Catholicism, mm -hmm. have developed this um, this idea that abortion is uh, have to be uh, avoided. I mean, it's a uh, it's, a, it's a really something that is related to religion because it's related to the control of the woman. And we cannot separate yeah. abortion from the religious um, based belief that consider that women have to be controlled by men. This is really very close to the beliefs in all the religions. Uh, the other points is that uh, although the laws have been uh, almost all, um, at least in our region in the Middle East, they have been all inspired by the French or the English civil code. Uh, they all, all these uh, civil codes have been inspired by the Catholic religion. So it's really so close and so uh, intricate. I mean, you cannot separate like this and it's all originally related to the male domination and to the patriarchal, because control of the woman's body and control of the fertility is really related to the control by the men. Thank you. I just, I wanted to jump in quickly on two things. I think the question is a really interesting question, partially because any form of um, oppression if we're looking at because we can see this this abortion control as some form of a manifestation of misogyny to a certain extent. Eh? Um, it is going to be supported by an ideology. We don't often see the patriarchy, but I think that controls both men and women very negatively. And so, yes, I think this is an ideology that is really restricting and a control mechanism that negatively affects both men and women. I think men have to be engaged in the conversation. But I also think religion has had a very nuanced, I mean, and faith is very critical for many people in our across the world, and it has been very useful for many people across the world. I also think where we are right now with many religious stances on abortion, not taken into consideration the Jewish approach, which is very nuanced, it has been, the Christian approach has been nuanced throughout the years. Um, even the Catholic Christian approach has been nuanced as to when ensoulment happened. So what often happens with our narratives is that there's an assumption that this is how it has always been, but that is not the case. And the conversation needs to now start moving towards when did more of a patriarchal ideology infiltrate our religious ideologies to have us where we are right now? 
If I can just build on that, um, I, I agree that we need to always think ac across time and our histories when there were different arguments that were made. And some of the abortion laws are, are laws that were implemented because they were in alignment with other family planning policies. And always women's bodies have been controlled in certain ways by pro-natalist regimes that want women to have more children. And then they've been controlled by regimes that are like, no, we need to limit family size. So it's always that bodies are used both by religious authorities, by patriarchy, by the medical establishment in different ways to conform to certain standards and societal norms. There were times when, I mean, life begins at conception. That notion is a recent conception. That's not what Catholics always thought. And a lot of the research shows that when midwives were supporting abortions and providing abortions, when it became more something that medical doctors provided, it was not wanting to lose that control from the medical establishment. Um, I would say that one of the main, main challenges, even around like contraception, is that what is tracked at the global level and what is advocated for are women methods, like male methods of contraception. We hardly even talk about condoms or vasectomies at all. I'm sorry, we just don't. They're not tracked. They're not thought of as methods that anyone's going to use. And so that was something when you think about sexuality and responsibility and accountability being both something owned by men and women, that is not something that we're seeing basically, I think, supported by the global community. It's really always women that are the ones that are responsible. And yet our rights are also restricted. Yeah. Patsy, shall I uh, read out uh, the next question, which actually was a question that I had as well. I mean, here in the US, we know that um, LGBTQ organizations are very worried um, in terms of uh, the question on same-sex marriage. And there is a kind of obvious link um, between reproductive rights and rights around, um, well, challenging heteronormativity. And so I'm the question of alliances came to my mind. And uh, Rita Slowy, hello, Rita, is asking how do queer movements in both regions intersect and interact with the region's movements for access to abortions? And um, so maybe I'm going to ask um, Tony Ann to start us off. Sean, I'm sorry, I, I was late. And then after this, I have to run. Um, I think right now, for too long, we're functioning in a bit of a silo within our spaces here. Uh, the LGBTQI plus community has been excellently organized around um, litigious advocacy. So we're starting to see a lot of the decriminalization of um, the LGBTQI movement, but it is happening in a bit of a silo. And this is partially because perhaps not enough space was made for LGBTQI plus issues within the women's movement originally. But we do need to ensure we do not have a divide and conquer. We speak often about divide and conquer in our region with LGBTQI plus issues and issues around sexual reproductive health and rights. Globally, for example, in Ireland and many other places, we had movements on LGBTQI plus rights before we had movement on abortion rights or even maternity leave, because this is some of the reason why we're saying put it all together because fine, okay, you, you, we're, we're not going to decriminalize abortion, but then we have no maternity leave. We have no support for these children who are here. And so I think it is critical that we start seeing more of the coming together on ensuring that there's not a rollback on the progress that has been made and that we have significant advancement as it pertains to sexual reproductive health and rights. And it is not an either or, it is not a divide and conquer. If we're talking about the issue of period poverty, if we're talking about these issues of sexual reproductive health and rights, we don't have to get into the conversation of who actually is a woman. That is, I think that is actually a very patriarchal and misogynist approach to this, this conversation. We need to talk about this as a human rights issue and all of the colleagues who have been marginalized coming together to discuss it. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Tonya. I mean, I'm going to ask uh, Salma or Leila to comment. I mean, uh, in the context of the Middle East, there is, of course, the issue that feminists historically have always been discredited for being Western or imitating the West. And that is particularly the case now for, you know, queer activists. So how does that play out in the context of reproductive rights? Are there alliances? Is there sort of an attempt to keep this separate, to not actually be attacked for being Western or alien. Dino Selma, do you want to start us off here? Yes, I think uh, what happened is that uh, starting with the stigmatization um, as queer um, LGBTQ people have been stigmatized and attacked in a very strong, very violent way. They have been, um, I mean, there were um, a coalition with all the feminists and the human rights um, organization. And uh, probably that LGBTQ have been the most stigmatized for access to abortion. So they are more sensitized than the other uh, women, the women, no, I mean, uh, the other women to uh, the access to safe abortion. So there were um, a consciousness of the importance of the, um, uh, advocacy for safe abortion for all categories, including the queer. And it's right then, uh, the queer have been more, um, I mean, they are more efficient and more uh, strong in developing advocacy for any, um, any fight they are uh, conducting. So they have been very helpful in developing this uh, uh, very direct, very open mind advocacy for safe abortion in the region, in, in Tunisia, I mean. And I think it's the same for almost all the region, all the other countries of uh, of the MENA region. Yeah, thank you, Leila. So have... uh, Leila, would you like to add something? Well, I, I would just say that, that yeah, the, the region criminalizes sexuality and reproduction, and many countries have anti-homosexuality bills and, and other ways of controlling sexuality. So I think there are a lot of common trends. There's groups like the Coalition for Bodily and Sexual Rights that comes together across the issues. LGBTQI plus activists have been leading the charge on a lot of key issues in the US around bodily rights and sexual rights. And there's a linkage there. Uh, but again, I think we just need to do more because there is a lot of fragmentation um, and challenges because our bodies are attacked and a lot of the human rights defenders are attacked given the oppressive regimes of the region and the crackdown on civil society that hasn't helped to foster more of this cross movement work. Yeah, yeah. And we are speaking, of course, now in the context of two regions, but I mean, it cuts across globally. I mean, I'm now involved in editing a book looking at anti-gender, anti-feminist discourses yes. and political homophobia in Europe and the Middle East. And in Europe, I mean, see just what happened in Italy when you look at yes. the kinds of discourse. Uh, it's uh, all across the world. But I'd also like to hear from Marble. Do you have any reflections on, on this question? Yes, um, well, I think uh, in the region we have some uh, difficulties, maybe some years ago, to work together with LGBTQI plus in those issues. But we improve, and I think now is something that we are together. But also it depends in each country. For example, in Argentina, uh, it was a decision that made by men politicians to decide that when we are discussing the abortion law and the same uh, sex marriage, they decided to discuss same sex marriage and not abortion because it was a, a way to have access and possibility to recruit followers among those groups. Political, in, in terms of political uh, support, I don't know if you can understand what I say, but with abortion, they suppose is going to bring them out some of their followers. So politicians are looking for votes, so they need to ensure they increase. So they decided this. We were very close with them, of course, you can imagine, 
inside the political parties, but we could obtain to have uh, the work together with the LGBTQI plus. And now we can say that we are together fighting for abortion or for same sex and more, we are fighting for the recognition of identity orientation or sexuality that is more than same sex. And we have here, so the people and also the uh, children and adolescents can go and say in the justice, I'm feeling a woman, so please change my identity and they can. This is a very important point. So we are, we are working now all together, but sometimes it's coming some functions when it comes from the issue of the money. If we can have support for abortion, if it's going to be against to have money support to support LGBTQI+. Uh, this is something that in reality happens and I need to mention because uh, this is something that we need to consider that the possibilities to have funding, they are greater now for LGBTQI plus than for the abortion groups. So sometimes they are reluctant to work with us, not to lose their fundings. This is a reality. Can I jump in here and acknowledge um, just positive news of Cuba agreeing both in a, a referendum with support by the government to legalize gay marriage. And Cuba has been one of the countries in the region that has, has the longest um, abortion. Yeah, um, access <laughs> to abortion. So just a positive, a positive note. And I, I think I don't think we have time to for answers, but something that that you know, I, I've been thinking about is the extent to which, I mean, there, if you look at the Caribbean, I mean, these laws are in place for most countries, restrictive laws, but I don't believe that they are enforced in the main part. And I'm wondering the extent to which there is actual enforcement across the region, how that might vary from one country to the other, even when restrictive laws exist. And the role of surveillance, what seems to be an increasing openness for doctors, nurses, neighbors, friends to um, force, you know, action to be taken against women um, who have abortions or are suspected of having abortions. So just, just a question, especially since this has increased the surveillance of women and access to abortion, I think, you know, is probably changing the picture a lot. But we're 129, and I think um, that we have to wrap up. And I'll turn it over to Nadia, but just to say that, you know, this has been a really enlightening um, conversation. And I'm really so grateful to you for spending the time to be with us this morning, this afternoon. Yeah, same. Thank you, uh, Patsy. Thank you, all, all of you. I mean, we could have gone on. We should go on. I mean, this is an important conversation. Um, it is, um, as I said, globally, um, women's rights, reproductive rights, uh, queer rights are under attack as we see the rise of a political right. We see the mainstreaming of far-right ideas into uh, political parties. And it is the time that we um, learn from each other, raise consciousness, um, make alliances. So I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to also draw your attention to an event we are organizing on Tuesday um, from 2 to 3 p.m. EST to focus on the events in Iran and where we also try to make connections between uh, gender protest and authoritarianism. And I think it, this, this discussion is also relevant to what we are talking about here today. So many thanks. Uh, those of you who are watching this, uh, thank, I would like to also thank the audience. The event is um, being recorded and will be made available so we can share it with your friends, students, colleagues, fellow activists. 
So thank you all and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.